It feels great, actually. I feel really proud and I feel flattered. And, um, and coming down in the car, you kind of wonder why you, you know, obviously it's, it's usually vanity is the reason you accept these things. But I think in the industry, it's quite important for creative people to be acknowledged educationally because it's, it's a vast proportion of our, of our GDP. You know, it's in, in filmmaking, is a, we make a lot of money from this country from film writing. I think it's uh, uh, from screenwriting and it travels well, we travel well. I think it's good for students to see people acknowledged who've done well and I've done really well <laughs> <laughs> and I deserve it. <laughs> I work harder than most people I know yeah. and, and I think the results of the stuff that comes out doesn't look like anything you've seen before and that's all you have to do sometimes. You don't have to come up with a lot of writers sit and wait for ideas. I know we're talking about Kiel, but it does matter. To, this matters to the question because uh, I think when you're you're being you're being asked to come up with something that's unique, and the industry mainly talks you into being homogenised because they like a structure. And basically, I mean, the thing I'm working on now, I look at it and I go, I haven't a clue how to describe it to you. And I think the best things are things that don't look like anything else. And the audience, yes, they know they're being looked after uh, when, 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 when you just take them to somewhere they didn't know they wanted to go. And I think getting an honorary award uh, for knowing how to pull that off quite a few times over, is, it feels correct. <laughs> From the age of about five or seven, I wanted to be a surgeon. And when I told the woman at school I wanted to be a surgeon, she wrote down ambulance driver. <laughs> I don't know why has she done that to me? And I knew what she was, that she was peripatetic, she just came into the school as a career. And I just thought, oh, do you know what, f you. And I was going to be a surgeon. And then by, literally by the age of 19, I'd become a writer behind my back. And I think I'd become a writer because I was in a family full of, there were 10 people who lived in the house there were regularly 20 people in the house, and I swear the whole house wouldn't, is smaller than this. And there were just people there all over, and I couldn't bear listening to people, because they talk <laughs> And I worked out really early, I think I was about 10, when it, it's quicker to count the words people miss out, if you want to hear the truth. Uh, because there was so much chat, 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 chat. And I think it taught me to go three rows back, and so you can listen to it, but you're not listening to it literally. And that kind of somehow turned me into a writer because I was a good writer, <clears throat> and I was, the, you know, without with no disrespect to my siblings, I was the only literate one. <clears throat> so whatever I wrote, they couldn't read. I was kind of compelled towards it, and it wasn't. It wasn't a job. Right, a writer isn't a job you perceive. Certainly not from uh, living in Burnley, where you know you had your choice of factories, and if you went to Mission and it was, wow, that's over time and a half. Yeah, wow. And you were a clever lad if you got to mission. I'd rather stick pins in my eyes than do that. And so I just kind of drift off. And, uh, you know, I became psychiatrically ill. And I think it was the best thing that happened to me because I got a complete reboot. And, you know, my family wasn't a normal family. And, but looking at how much I'd learned from observing that family, and coming out with a different skill set, a different toolkit, because I was fostered and these people weren't, hoity-toity, you know, Christian souvenir fosterers. They were, she ran a record store and wore short skirts and, and I just got a whole new life. And, and that, that, that early life in Burnley was a, a, a really tough life, but actually I think it taught me to stand three rows back so that when you're writing, you're not actually writing about what they're literally saying. You're writing about what you feel in the way you'll describe it to someone else and make them feel the same thing. And that's a really hard transition for a writer, but I picked it up really early on. I, can, I heard dialogue really early on, because you can tell when people are lying by the words they miss out, and you go, wow, if you know how to do that structurally, that's a script. And um, yeah, so I, I just wrote short stories, and there was a school teacher called Bill Bradley. You know, just, you know, everybody's got an English teacher they remember, and this guy was a tough Canadian big guy and he loved me because I could write you know I was like his A student only in the one subject um, but he sold one of my short stories for a tenner and he'd sent it off and they bought it and I got I got paid money I think I was 
15, nearly 16. Yeah. And, uh, and it was like 10 pounds, but it was money for writing. And I think the equation kicked in. I think the Burnley Writers Circle was, I mean, you have to know that I, I, I was, you know, it's like when you wore razor blades and I had 12 old docks and, you know, like, um, you know, uh, 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 cricket pants and stuff like that with earrings and green hair. And, and I went into this, uh, this writer's circle that was full of silver-haired, it was, it was in the conservative club opposite the police station in Burnley. And as an abbot, you were constitutionally not allowed in that zone. <laughs> and, you know, it should have been terrifying, but I just went up, I didn't care what I looked like, I didn't care what people thought. These, all these women have been writing for these magazines, not successfully for quite a long time, but they knew the price of every page of every magazine. And that's, you know, I don't mean I was interested in the money. I wanted to vindicate what I did in writing by being paid for it. I deserved to be paid for it. And that's, but these people had all the information, but not, some of them were really talented and uh, you're one or two, but most of them were just people who talked about what rejections they'd got. And, um, but it was a fan fascinating uh, piece of intel gathering. And I just kind of went, I think it was every second Saturday or something like that. And um, really embarrassing to walk into the building <laughs> and sneak it in so none of my mates could see me. You'd sit there listening to all these people read their stories out, which were often chronic. And, um, but you learnt your, there were really good people there and you learnt the difference. Yeah. Mm. So that was vital. Radio Times used to have an annual drama awards for a brand new television play, a brand new radio play. And, and I'd, never written, I'd never written dialogue before. I'd written short stories and I just kind of trained up on short stories and I just did. It, it, it came out of me. I didn't find it. It found me. And so you do stories do really well and that was the only way I could keep in at school. If I, did, if I got an A there, it didn't matter whether I got a C there, nobody would give a <laughs> but I kept getting A's and excellence and all that. And so it's really important, but uh, I think the, um, uh, 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 the Radio Times Drama Awards, when it came out, I just thought, oh, wow, I might have a go at both. I'll write a television play and a radio play. And they both kind of turned into radio plays because there wasn't enough visual, they were quite internalized pieces. So, so I wrote them both, but you needed a professional sponsor. Somebody knew where Alan Bennett lived, so I just dro dropped him a note, didn't send the script. And he said, well done for not sending the script and asking if I'd like to read it. Yes, I would. Like he was having a tantrum against all the people who'd sent him a big fat script this big. <laughs> and I just did it the polite way. And he turned it around within two days and said, it's not the masterpiece you think it is, but I'll certainly put my name to it. Mm -hmm. And it went into the competition. Uh, two plays, the other play was sponsored by Roy Clark. And I didn't know either of these people. I just found their addresses. Some, I knew somebody uh, who worked at Sheffield University, knew Roy Clark, and somebody who lived near where Alan Bennett lives. <laughs> so I just kind of, um, you know, tried my luck. And, and they both came back and sponsored, and both plays got made. They didn't win anything in the competition, but they both got made quite quickly. And then I got invited, I got commissioned to write a Monday night play, which was really big. You know, it's a 90-minute play. And you got, like, 1,250 quid for it but it repeats on Saturday, so that was two and a half grand, and it paid, that was my rent. Yeah. So I became a writer that year. Yeah. You know, you go, wow. And I was a little bit angry that I wasn't a surgeon. You go, well, you, forgetting the chemistry and the maths, you couldn't have been anyway. <laughs> but, um, but it crept up on me, and I became a writer. When I had to pay tax as a writer, you go, wow, I've just found myself a job. <laughs> You've got to be really precise with stuff, and, I, and it's a funny thing to try and it's a slight thing to try and say with words. But there are words I've just changed one word in a 62-page script, and I think it changes the entire script. It's one word, and that's surgical. <laughs> um, yeah, it's changed the entire complexion of the. It's one tiny word, and it's a swear word, but it's where it belongs, and it's just one word, and it changes the entire complexion of the piece. And words can, if you pick them carefully. <laughs> yeah, on, on Coronation Street, as the, as, as the newer writers in, you'd always get the worst episodes. But um, uh, now and again, you had to get a good one. And I think one of my, my favourite ones was uh, taking Don Brennan's uh, leg off. 
Um, it was a car accident. Of course, a car accident on Coronation Street. It's that Alan Bradley. Oh, and I worked on that one. Alan Bradley going under a tram at five and a half miles an hour. And, and it was just ludicrous. It seemed ludicrous. And it was such a big storyline. The audience loved it. Um, but when my audition script, when I went in, was just after Stan Ogden had died. So I wrote a script. My, my trial script was the one where Jack gets Stan's window cleaning round. And which happened, you know, it was an episode that had been commissioned. They commissioned you at the same time as the writer, so you can't be copying. And you've got to deliver when that writer does. Then I think my act was better. <laughs> it really, I, I stayed up about three nights to get it right. You know, to go, I'm going to show off. <laughs> well, I think, you know, on, on Coronation Street, I used to love, you know, because you, you've got such tight margins, you've got, you, your creative margins are really tight. But if you don't understand it, you can elasticate margins and you, <clears throat> you can write stuff how you want, so long as you supply the basic franchise of a good Coriette. <clears throat> and, you know, and the street, the Coronation Street streets were exactly the shape of the streets I grew up on, except in Burnley, they, they, they were stone-built houses. So they looked like they should be worth a lot more money. They were just, they were ropey. It's really ropey. And um, um, when I worked on Coronation Street, I couldn't, bear the thought that, you know, all these writers who had been sports writers on the Manchester Evening News and blah, 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 and they all thought that Hilda Ogden was the lowest it got. And I once sat there in a story conference and I, uh, I sometimes just can't not shoot my mouth off. And um, uh, I said, she spends more than I do. She has more disposable ink, she buys more newspapers, more loaves, if you count the amount of time she's been at the shop, and she's had more drinks in the bar than anybody could afford in a disposable income week. And it, and it was just wrong. Well, I think when Shameless, when I came up with Shameless, I think I knew how to write Shameless as a result of having written Corrie. Because I wanted it to behave like a soap. Nobody wants to watch a thing about poverty. So you've got to ex you know, make it, give it extremities that are going to be more entertaining. If you're ever going to tell the truth, you've got to make them laugh or they'll kill you. And actually, I was trying to tell the truth about a certain level of poverty. And um, Frank was my um, immune system, because uh, he, he you know, is my defense mechanism, because they just laugh at him. And, and I was really proud of getting away with shameless. But I think when I worked on Curry, I knew there was a, the whole, there was a whole series beneath Curry, and shameless became it. And I wasn't, I didn't have a burgeoning kind of, uh, uh, campaign to write about my family, but when I realised they fitted together as a piece of television uh, truth, I, th I thought, yeah, we, if we got away with murder on Shameless, and I think because it was written so carefully to look like, um, you know, its humanity was its highest stamp, um, but you only got the humanity through the comedy. Nobody would watch Poverty, but you had to, mm -hmm. and uh, I thought that was a real triumph, but I certainly learnt my skills for that on Corrie. Everybody bitches about the fact there aren't enough writers, but nobody puts their money where their mouth is. And you know, it's hard work mentoring <coughs> a new writer. You know, when you've got to get on with your own work, it's really hard work mentoring a new writer. But when you're mentoring five or six, it can be, um, you know, like occupational rape. Um, uh, but now, watching all those writers come through and coming through with their own new series, you go, wow, they wouldn't have been there. You know, I'm, I, yeah, not out of vanity, but out of relief. You can sit back and enjoy what someone else has written. I've no idea how it happens, and we've, we've had... Um, no, I've no idea how it happens. They, they just kind of appear, and they're not all local to us. Some are from Bristol, some are from Glasgow. Uh, um, but, yeah, people put scripts in front of me that I like, and then, yeah, good scripts get their way through. I've never seen a good script not sell. And a lot of people think it's a good script, but it's a good script when it sells. <laughs> well, I think a lot of people don't ask the biggest question because they think the biggest question, they'll go two questions down. If, you know, if you're going to write to Alan Bennett, write to Alan Bennett. Don't write to his secretary. Uh, you know, you, you have to find, you get your intelligence right. Um, like the people, don't just write to everybody. Find the people who like 
who are making the kind of stuff you genuinely can talk about, because then you don't turn up going, oh, I think you're brilliant. I think you're brilliant because I love this. I love the fact you don't do that. You know, turn up informed. Um, um, but I think the best advice, certainly for writers, is you know, don't ever let anybody see your work first off. It's like three, four, five times before, it's three times certainly. Don't finish a script and send it to somebody. It isn't a script. And you, a week later, this is, this is what a huge amount of writers do. They'll write something, or a week later, they'll read it and they go, well, shit. And you go, well, and so they stop writing. Or they stop for now and go and do something else. They go, well, if you know a week later that it's shit, when you sat and typed it, you thought it was glorious. If you know a week later it's shit, you must know what's not so move it on, move it on, move it on. And do it two, three times before you send it to anybody. Then you, you can really account for it. If you send an underwritten script to somebody who's going to ask you big questions and you can't answer them, you won't get back in their door again. If you ask, answer good questions wrongly but interestingly, they'll have you. Because they just want people who've thought about their work. You know, you're creating a five-course meal, not a script. It's not what you think, it's what... You, it's about how the people you're writing it for will receive it. You're not the big guy, they're your, they're your paymasters. And I don't mean the BBC, I mean the audience. It's a jet black comedy cop show. Because I love cop shows, I love it when they work, they're never funny. Um, and this is just not like anything you've ever seen. And it's just a cop show, but it's not. It's, it's, uh, um, there are, yeah, it's really hard to describe and I think it just doesn't look like anything else is the best way to say for now and uh, I'll let you see it before it goes out. Maybe we can do a screening here or something. You can tell a story about anywhere from anywhere but I mean I think it's vital politically to spread your wares about and the BBC having moved to Manchester, having been forced to move to Manchester to be honest. Um, Manchester is now so full of production, we're having to hire crews. There aren't enough people trained. We've had to hire from all over the place, on um, no offence, because everybody's busy. And that's fantastic because you do get the voice of a region. I think the North's always been represented on telly. Um, but, but the North's a big place and there are a lot of different types of people in there. I think the more drama you get coming out the more north the less generic it's going to look yeah. and uh, I, I love it because it's it's yeah everybody's busy and all the people who were training up uh like 10 years ago you'd be training them in thinking oh, i'm not sure what works available from train as well as you like and now you know they're all producing yeah. or show running it's great yeah. i love it <laughs>